In northwestern Mexico, the Sierra Madre Mountains stretch far beyond the limits of vision. With peaks jutting hundreds of feet in the air and sharply sloped cliffs descending just as far, just as suddenly, the Sierra Madre form a natural barrier to most forms of land travel. A cross-country trip of five miles given the terrain can easily become 10, 15, or more. Even now, wind and weather continue the slow process that began long ago, sculpting the landscape into impossible, sometimes haunting shapes. Usually, we think of Mexico as warm and dry, and it is, sometimes. But many thousands of feet above sea level, the seasons here are much like those in the northern United States, warm summers, cold and snowy winters. Although it's only 300 miles south of the U.S. border, this place could be one of the most primitive regions in North America. And yet, for some people, this is home. The Tarahumara Indians, a shy, gentle people, whose primitive lifestyle hasn't changed substantially in hundreds of years. Even today, many of them are cave dwellers with homes nestled high in the mountains. Others live in more traditional but not particularly desirable surroundings. Tiny handcrafted structures with dirt floors, no plumbing or electricity. Often they'll share this confined space with not only children, but perhaps elderly parents as well. The home might be the center of life on a small farm, two acres or so, where the family grows corn or beans and tends to a few animals. Their diet is almost exclusively vegetarian. Sheep are shorn for clothing and blankets, a few chickens might be raised for eggs, and goats are raised exclusively for fertilizer. Here, prosperity isn't measured by the size of your home or the number of things you own. Most people don't have much to measure. In this society, success is defined in far more basic terms. Very simply, having the essential skills necessary to shelter and feed your family. Nothing is wasted. The camera crew has just shared some fruit with the Tarahumara guide. And almost instinctively, the man takes the time to clean and dry the seeds and tuck them carefully away in a leaf in the hope that he might be able to plant them and one day share this meal again. After hundreds of years in this isolated place, the Tarahumara understand the meaning of self-reliance. They make their own pottery and baskets for storing and serving food, and clothing and blankets for protection from the elements. Their Spartan lifestyle centers on essentials, on needs rather than desires. A discarded oil drum might become a pot for cooking, a pine cone serves as a brush and comb combined. Handmade musical instruments provide one of the few forms of recreation, as well as the ritual accompaniment and ceremonial gatherings. One writer, sharing his observations on the Tarahumara in the 1930s, wrote in part, this race has for 400 years resisted every force that has come to attack it. Civilization, war, winter, storms, animals, and the forest. For the most part, the forces that have come to attack the Tarahumara have been tamed, animals certainly, and the forest in particular. The land which provides food, shelter, and the raw materials for a barter and subsistence level economy. And certainly the Tarahumara have resisted our notion of civilization. 
but some forces take more than tradition and a strong will to overcome. Disease, for instance. Here, only 300 miles below the U.S. border, the litany of illnesses reads as though it were something from another time and place. Malnutrition, scurvy, beriberi. Dysentery, parasites, pneumonia, tuberculosis, even polio. Today, and largely as a result of one man's work, there's an effort underway to help these people. When Father Luis Verplanken, a Jesuit priest, first arrived here, he saw a culture on the verge of extinction. Food and water were rare commodities. Health care was almost non-existent. And the infant mortality rate was staggering. 80% of the children would die before reaching age five. Verplanken first established a mission here in the early 60s. And then, lacking the funds he needed to build a permanent health care facility, he improvised. For many Tara Humaras, this Jeep brought the first encounter with visitors from the outside, visiting healthcare professionals, and the only access to modern medicine. Where before, disease among the Indians almost certainly led to discomfort, disfigurement, or death, there was now at least the hope that things could change. Father Verplanken's traveling healthcare facility wasn't very traditional, but it was efficient. Here, a dollar's worth of penicillin was enough to treat hundreds of infants who might otherwise perish. It wasn't long before word about the four-wheeled clinic began to spread, not only among the Tara Humara, but also in communities in the United States. The result? Eventually, enough donations by 1964 to establish a small hospital in an old railroad warehouse in nearby Creole, and enough publicity by word of mouth to attract patients who might walk for as long as three days through the mountains to get there, often carrying a sick child all the way. As hospitals go, you couldn't get much more basic than this. The waiting room was a small porch. The hospital itself was always either crowded or overcrowded. And there were no surgical facilities, not even a constant supply of fresh running water. Clearly, by US standards, the hospital was less than perfect. But compared to the Jeep or nothing at all, that small hospital was a monument to the need that existed. And in many ways, it was a cornerstone for what was to come. As the demands of the facility grew, so did the need for a constant clean water supply. And so did Verplanken's vision of a larger, more modern hospital, one that could treat more patients and more serious cases. But for the moment, the most pressing need was simply water. The odds against the priest and his group were enormous. The nearest fresh water supply lay four miles away and at a different elevation. Money? They had none. So against the odds, and with the continued help of donations and volunteers, they began work on a pipeline that would later stun the American engineers who came to see it. The finished product wound its way across four miles of jagged rock, up a 600-foot elevation, and through three handcrafted pumping stations. It was a masterpiece of engineering and economy it was built for $60,000 and valued by U.S. engineers at close to $3 million. But that wasn't the point. The point was the town of Creel and the Children's Hospital now had their first dependable supply of fresh water. And that was just the beginning. Now, with a continuous link to this most precious commodity of all, it became easier to dream even bigger dreams. Planning for the new hospital began in the mid-70s, and like the pipeline, the project was a tribute to ingenuity and self-reliance. It was truly handmade. For Planken designed the structure himself with the help of his nephew, an architectural student. He and his volunteers quarried the stone and crafted the brick for the building.
later, the people turned their energies to cutting trees, hauling logs, and sawing timber to complete the structure. The new Tarahumara Children's Hospital, a 70-bed facility, opened in 1979. The work that's visible for the most part is the work of volunteers, workers who donated their time and effort to the cause. But parts of the structure are less obvious. The work of donors, for example, whose contributions had been leveraged in ways that seem almost impossible. At the time the hospital was built, the average construction cost for a small U.S. hospital was about $90 a square foot. This one had been built for $5.50 a square foot. And though the hospital had cost only $98,000 to build, its value was estimated at nearly one and a half million dollars. But this accomplishment can't really be measured in dollars. Its true significance has more to do with the range of services the hospital provides and the growth that continues even today. Serving a community of some 12 to 13,000 people, the hospital has a busy outpatient practice. Examination rooms are used daily for checkups, immunizations, and treating minor cuts and burns. A laboratory operates through the day, performing the tests required to diagnose and treat a variety of conditions. In the dental care unit, professionals provide free, sometimes urgent care for teeth that in many cases have been long neglected. Sometimes, a checkup might suggest an x-ray, which can be taken right down the hall and processed and read immediately, using equipment and supplies that have been donated over the years by various manufacturers, suppliers, and benefactors. The staff consists of doctors, nurses, nuns, and others who either volunteer their services or work for a fraction of what they might earn elsewhere. The few patients who can afford to pay for treatment, mostly Mexicans living nearby, are asked to pay only what they can afford, more of a donation than a fee. And usually the payment amounts to only a small portion of the cost of care. In fact, more than 90% of the services the hospital provides are offered free. Some of those services are basic, but essential, like the hot breakfasts, lunches, and dinners cooked in the kitchen. Others are far more sophisticated, like the surgery performed in this operating room. Often the most seriously ill patients are the youngest ones, the ones who can't always tell you where it hurts, how badly it hurts, or how long it's been hurting. Some of these children appear relatively healthy at first until a checkup, x-ray, or lab test turns up signs of tuberculosis, heart or kidney failure in the early stages, or perhaps even brain damage from prior untreated infections. When the children are brought here in time, the results can be truly remarkable. This six-year-old weighed only 18 pounds when she was admitted. But with the loving care given to her in the hospital, she was eventually able to go home. This child, his frail features contorted from starvation when he arrived, was ready to leave the hospital only weeks later. And another, her malnourished body ravaged even further by ulcerated burns, might have been found lifeless in the mountains one day. But instead, someone brought her here. It took dedication donations, and volunteers to build this hospital. Men and women who knew how to approach difficult problems with unconventional, creative solutions. And today, it's that same spirit that keeps it running. You see it in the people who operate the St. Jude Express, based in Albuquerque, New Mexico. These pilots accept no pay for flying into the mountains each month and landing their fragile craft on a small, crude airstrip. The cargo? More volunteers. Visiting medical professionals 
who bring critical skills along with critically needed equipment and supplies. In addition to treating patients, and together with Father Verplanken and his staff, they review hospital records, inventories of equipment and supplies, and the needs of the hospital pharmacy. Some choose to stay on for quite a while. Mary, a California pharmacist, volunteered to stay in the region for a year. That was more than 25 years ago. Today, this pharmacy dispenses nine to 10,000 prescriptions or more each year. And unlike the refills we're accustomed to, patients are usually given enough medicine for a complete treatment. Because here, when a patient leaves the pharmacy, home might be hours or even days away. Father Verplanken and his people built the hospital to treat the outcomes of poverty, starvation, and disease. They built the mission schools to treat the causes. Here, in the purest sense, education means survival. Children aged six to eight attend classes taught in their native language. Older ones, until they finish school at age 12 or 13, learn Spanish as well. Thus, they take with them not only the ability to communicate among their own, but also the skills to work and trade with others outside the community. Just like schools in the U.S., the curriculum is designed to meet the needs of the students to prepare them for adult life. And here, that translates to classes in hygiene, teaching children to care for themselves. The students also learn about farming. Even the youngest ones learn the basics of planting and growing food. When they're ready, they'll learn about more advanced topics, methods of coping with the dry land, the high altitude, and the short growing season, methods of survival in this most inhospitable environment. The aim is for the students to become self-sufficient. The hope is that they'll one day share their knowledge with others. And the signs are that that dream is coming true. This class is now taught by a Tara Humara Indian, a former student of the mission school. In fact, lots of dreams are coming true. Today, access to the hospital and the mission isn't limited only to those well enough or determined enough to get there, because once again, the hospital has come to the people and set up a traveling health clinic where children can be weighed, their growth charted, and Tara Humara of all ages can be examined, immunized against diseases that might otherwise interrupt or even end their lives. Deeper in the mountains, Verplanken and his volunteers still make house calls. They tackle the easy part of the trail with a four-wheel drive. And a few miles later, when the going gets really tough, they continue the trip in a more traditional way. Many hours and many miles later, the group arrives at a small mountain home. The doctors and paraprofessionals check each family member and dispense medicine if necessary. And after a few friendly words and a blessing from Father Luis, they make their way to the next home. Here, in these vast, steep mountains, Father Verplanken and his staff continue as they have for years to administer to the needs of a people who might otherwise perish. Victims of a hostile environment, a primitive way of life, a bitter past, and in many ways, an uncertain future. Against the odds, tremendous odds, the effort has been successful. The infant mortality rate is now down to less than a tenth of what it was for Indians living within the range of the hospital. But range is the key word. With a mission serving 12 to 13,000 people, that leaves another estimated 50,000 or so Tara Humara who live too far away to reap the benefits of the work being done. Deeper in the mountains, the Tara Humara still border on extinction. But perhaps there's still hope.
Today, there is a celebration. On a day as important as this one, tradition dictates the music to be heard, the instruments played, the songs to be sung, the dances danced, even the food that will be eaten. In song, dance, and chants that are perhaps centuries old, the Indians give thanks for this day. Eventually, the Indian ritual gives way to another celebration, one that's many years older than the Indian rites and far more familiar in Western culture. Celebration, with good reason. Today, 12 Tarahumara women will become the first ever within the community to complete a mission-sponsored four-year study of medicine. Loosely translated, they've become what the Indians call health promoters. They aren't doctors or nurses in the traditional sense, but in many ways, they're a little of both. Trained in first aid, immunization, diagnosis, and disease prevention, these 12 people will be the first of the Tarahumara to take the work and the word of the Creole mission to the most remote regions of the Sierra Madre. Looking back, there's a lot to be proud of, a lot to be thankful for. Today, more children are surviving. Children who might have perished only a few years before. And as more and more of those children pass through the mission school, there's the hope that future generations of Tarahumara will be better equipped to help themselves and one another. Maybe some will even save lives on their own. But tomorrow, the work goes on. Improved farming methods and an increased knowledge of farming will help these people make the best of what they have. But there isn't much that can be done about a short growing season, and there's virtually nothing that can be done to change this barren landscape into what we would think of as productive soil. And so malnutrition is still widespread among the Tarahumara. As the hospital treats more and more patients, either in the hospital or in the field, medicine and medical supplies are consumed and need constant replacement. Medical equipment is costly, and when equipment needs to be repaired or replaced, the money has to come from somewhere. The hospital staff works for little or no pay. But in a facility that provides more than 90% of its services for free, operating revenues, understandably, are quickly drained. And then again, what do you say to a family that doesn't have enough to eat? How do you respond to a child who's willing to learn but needs books and supplies, clothing and meals? What do you say to a mother who's carried her sick child through the mountains for days and arrived on your doorstep? And how do you deal with the realization that even with all the miracles you've witnessed, maybe you still haven't done enough? In this lifetime, most people will never have the privilege of saying they've saved someone's life. Your generosity can give you that privilege. If there is any truer measure of the human spirit than what one does, it must be what one gives.